about amendments that lawmakers want to offer to the health care bill and the parameters of debate. This is live coverage on C-SPAN 2. Medicare Physician Payment Reform Act of 2009. I'm delighted to welcome the distinguished chairman and ranking members from the committees of jurisdiction, Mr. Waxman and Mr. Barton. I will soon be here momentarily. But we're afternoon, we're very happy to start off with the Education and Labor Committee. And I welcome Chairman George Miller and all the great work in, and ranking member McKeon is not here. Are you standing in for Mr. McKeon today? Fine. All right, fine. fine. Well, Mr. McKeon became, Make, he's Mr. ranking on uh, the uh, Armed Services Committee now. Mr. McKeon went over there. When did that happen? Uh, a few months ago. Well, how about that? Yeah. My staff apparently did not know that. Oh. From the Ways and Means Committee, I welcome my friend and fellow New Yorker, Chairman Rangel and ranking member Camp. Without objection, gentlemen, your full statements will appear in the record. You may summarize if you choose. Let's begin with Mr. Rangel. Thank you, Madam Chair, Lady, Ranking Member David Breyer. I come before you today in support of HR 3962, the Affordable Health Care for America Act. This critical legislation moves our great nation one step closer to providing affordable health care for all Americans. This is an historic bill that, as much as it would help the co course, offer all Americans choice in competitions and participation stories. Too many families have had to fight them with insurance companies that refuse to provide coverage because of pre existing conditions. Under the current system, too many families, even those with insurance, go bankrupt from the staggering cost of health care. It is unacceptable that parents who are struggling to make ends meet and provide a brighter future for their children are forced to fend off collections agencies simply because their children have cancer. In this economy, we shouldn't have to worry about losing coverage when you change jobs or out of work of your company goes out of business. America's new health care system will work to solve these problems. Under this legislation, insurance companies will no longer be able to deny coverage uh, based on pre-existing conditions. Patients will choose their own plan and their own doctors. Everyone will pay for coverage on a sliding scale based on their family's income. Everyone will be assured coverage of essential benefits and receive basic rights and consumer protection. In America, affordable health care should be a right, not a privilege for the privileged few. Our legislation covers 96% of Americans putting affordable coverage within reach for millions of uninsured and uninsured families. The Affordable Health Care for America Act improves on what works today by building on employer-sponsored coverage and creating a new marketplace in which people can pick and choose among a variety of options. It will be truly functional markets where decisions can be made on price and quality, not to benefit and manipulation and discrimination. A public health insurance option will be among the choices available to those who purchase through the exchange. It would improve competition and accountability and give individuals and small businesses an alternative as to what currency currently exists. No one would be forced into the public option. It would only be one of many choices in a health insurance exchange, much like the Federal Employment Health Benefit Plan today. Those who want to keep their current policy may do so. Existing policies are grandfathered, so no one needs to move plans unless they choose to do so. It's like what you have. If you like what you have, you can keep what you have. This plan is ensuring choice, leveling the playing field, clear and simple. Our plan allows employees of small businesses who do not offer insurance to enter the insurance exchange, taking advantage of lower rates currently offered only to large groups and firms. For small businesses that do not offer insurance, our plan will provide tax credits to help offset the cost of health benefits. Our plan would also protect and strengthen Medicare. It improves benefits by one, lowering drug costs and closing the infamous donut hole, two, eliminating cost sharing for preventive service, three, emphasizing primary care 
and care coordination, and four, increase in access to assistance for senior citizens with low incomes. It also sets the stage for a modernized delivery system that focuses on quality and value while fighting waste, fraud, and abuse. The Affordable Health Act for America is fiscally sound. Not only does the bill not add one dime to the deficit, it actually reduces the deficit by more than $100 billion over 10 years. $30 billion if the class act is excluded. According to CBO, it continues to have a positive effect in the second decade. As chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, it's been an honor to be a part of this historic process of unprecedented cooperation between the three House Committee chairs that are here with us today with jurisdiction over health care. In nearly 40 years of public service, I can say that the level of coordination between the committees, the House leadership, has truly been extraordinary. We were motivated not by the we were motivated by the urgency of the situation. We know that the health system in our country is broken, that each day more and more Americans are losing coverage, and that families and businesses are dependent on us to act. We are moving forward step by step, and at the end of the day, I'm confident that health reform has strengthened this great nation, provided affordable coverage to all Americans and increase the competitiveness of American business and help to rebuild our society. I thank uh, my colleagues, Chairman Waxman and Chairman Miller, for the extraordinary friendship and cooperation they have extended uh, to the Ways and Means Committee and its staff, and I look forward to working with President Obama and my House and Senate colleagues in the weeks ahead. And I thank you, Madam Chairlady, for the work that you've done to make our work possible. Thank you very much. We appreciate that, Mr. Rangel. Mr. Miller, let's hear from you. Chairman Slaughter, Ranking Member Dreyer, thank you very much for this opportunity to appear before the Rules Committee as well as the other members. Thank you for your patience that you'll exhibit today during the long hearing that you have me have before you. I'm pleased to be here with my colleagues, Chairman Waxman, Chairman, Chairman Rangel, and Ranking <coughs> Members Camp, Klein, and, and Barton. And I, I request that the committee provide an appropriate rule for H.R. 39 to the Affordable Health Care for America Act. The fight to reform this nation's health care system has, has been nearly a century in the, in the making. Great presidents like Teddy Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, John F. Kennedy, and many Congresses before us have tried to reform this nation's health care system. But time and again, these efforts have been stymied. This year is different. This time is different. The American people know that the current, the current system is crushing their families, their businesses, and the American economy. The, the America cannot wait any longer, and we will soon make good on our promise to the American people by passing the Affordable Health Care Act. We can hear you just fine, George. <laughs> Thank you. The discussion draft of this legislation was first released on July 19, 2009. The bill was introduced on, on July 14, 2009. This legislation is a product of substantial deliberation over the, over the last year. The three committees have spent nearly 100 hours in hearings where we heard from 181 Democratic and Republican witnesses, 83 hours in committee markups where 239 amendments were considered and 121 Republican and Democratic amendments were approved. Since this spring, members have held over 3,000 health care town hall meetings and public events in their districts. Many of the ideas were brought back to Washington and have been reflected in the bill before you today. The Affordable Health Care for America Act will guarantee for the first time that, that all Americans have access to quality, affordable health care. Never again will someone be denied health care coverage due to a pre-existing condition or because they lose their job. This legislation will set this country's health care system on a new and more sustainable course. It will end the insurer abuses and hold insurance companies accountable so that all Americans will never have to worry about the coverage being stripped from them just as they need it the most. With every year of inaction, families, businesses, and governments have seen their premiums and out-of-pocket expenses skyrocket. Families with insurance often find themselves
positions, gender or occupation, no annual caps on out-of-pocket expenses, guaranteed affordable dental, hearing, vision, and vision care for children. It will eliminate waste, fraud, and abuse in a healthcare system that costs this country billions of dollars every year. For small businesses, the bill will also provide much needed relief as, as they struggle to afford health care coverage. With access to the health insurance exchange, small business tax credits, this bill will help small businesses save billions of dollars. This bill will cover 97% of Americans by year 2015. Americans will always have access to affordable, quality health insurance, even if they lose or switch their jobs. Insurance companies will be prohibited from denying and limiting coverage due to pre-existing conditions. And starting immediately, Americans will no longer face lifetime limits on how much insurance companies will pay, meaning they'll never again be one treatment away from bankruptcy. It will provide a choice of doctors and, and, and insurance policies that the American people can choose. While choice will be protected, it will also be enhanced. Americans will have a wide variety of choices for quality and affordable plans, including a high-quality public insurance option to compete with the, with the private insurers. And we believe that it will increase the quality of care, and will, that will be determined by, the, by the, the providers of that care and not just the insurance companies. More family doctors and nurses will be able to enter the workforce, guaranteeing access to better treatment to meet patients' needs. These are because of the investments that are made in this legislation. And as, my, as my, the chairman, chairman Rangel pointed out, it will do this by being fiscal, while being fiscally responsible and reducing the deficit as determined by uh, the Congressional Budget Office. And I would hope that this committee would give us a favorable ruling. And again, I, also, I want to join Chairman Rangel in saying what, what an honor and, and a wonderful experience it was as these three committees worked together with a talented, talented professional staff and all of the members of the committee as we tried to work as one kind of atypical in the, in the history of this Congress in my 35 years being there uh, to, to develop a work product that works for the, for the American people and works for the members of Congress. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Miller. In the absence of uh, Mr. Waxman, let's go back to Ways and Means and Mr. Camp. Well, thank you, Madam Chairman and Ranking Member Dreyer. The people have spoken. They do not want a trillion dollar government plan to replace their health care. Republicans have listened to the American people, and it's clear from the Speaker's health care bill, H.R. 3962, the Democrat majority has not. The bill Speaker Pelosi crafted over the last three months behind closed doors, which has doubled in size from 1,000 to 2,000 pages, will do lasting damage to our economy, to medical innovation, and heap mountains of additional debt on our children and grandchildren, especially when combined with an unpaid-for bill to address the flawed Medicare physician payment system. This bill will kill American jobs. Using methodology developed by the President's top economic advisor, this bill causes us to lose another 5 million jobs, something we can't afford to do when our unemployment just reached 10.2% nationally and shows no sign of improving. The Democrats' bill will cut Medicare by up to one half trillion dollars, which will harm the health care of 11 million seniors. The Democrats' bill will pile debt on our children. The Democrats' bill will increase the federal commitment to health care by $600 billion, according to the Congressional Budget Office. And an earlier report by the nonpartisan Medicare actuary confirmed that the bill approved by Ways and Means would bend the curve upward, meaning health care would, would consume an even faster rising share of our economy. Office of Management and Budget Director Peter Orzag has stated, and I quote, the single most important thing we can do to improve the long-term fiscal health of our nation is slow the growth rate in health care costs, end quote. If the Budget Director is to be believed, then the worst thing we could do for our nation's long-term fiscal health is to increase the growth rate in health care costs by enacting the Speaker's health care bill. The Democrats' bill will raise taxes by over $700 billion. Many of those tax increases will hit families with incomes below $250,000, something the President has repeatedly promised he would not do. The Democrats' bill will use federal <coughs> funds to pay for abortions. The Democrats' bill will allow taxpayer money to subsidize health insurance for millions of illegal immigrants. I share the commitment of each of the members on the panel here today that we must do something to make our health care system better and more efficient. But the solution put forward by the majority's deep flaws make it one I cannot support. 
Republicans have a better solution, and I'm here to let the American people know and urge the Rules Committee to make an order for the purposes of substitute the House Republican alternative to this government takeover of health care. Let's be clear about the Republican bill. It delivers what the American people want, lower health care costs. According to the Congressional Budget Office, the Republican health care reforms would reduce premiums by up to 3% for Americans who get insurance through large businesses, up to 8% for Americans without employer-sponsored insurance, and up to 10% for those working for a small business. That's 50 or fewer employees. CBO has not made a claim that the Democrats' bill would lower premiums. The Republican bill will significantly reduce health care premiums, ensures millions of Americans, guarantees those with pre-existing conditions have access to quality, affordable health care, and does all of this without raising taxes, without spending the trillion dollars we don't have, without cutting Medicare, and without putting some new health czar in between doctors and patients, which is what the Democrat majority does in their government takeover bill. Americans' health care is too important and too complex to risk on, on this Democrat gamble. Instead, Republicans are promoting a step-by-step -step approach to comprehensive health care reform. And the first step is to make health insurance affordable for families, affordable for small businesses, and affordable for America. Finally, unlike the Democrat plan that increases taxes almost immediately, but delays reforms for several years, the Republican plan will immediately begin to lower costs. Madam Chairman, clearly the bill offered by the Speaker is not what the American people want. Americans are clamoring for lower cost health care, and that is what the Republican plan offers. Lower costs, health care without tax increases, without Medicare cuts, without adding to the deficit, and without eliminating jobs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Camp. Mr. Klein from uh, Energy and Commerce. Uh, or oh, Ed and Labor, sorry. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Ranking Member Dreyer, I don't know his name. Go microphone switch, Madam Chair. All right. It was. It seemed to be working Mark fine when you Bush. spoke a minute ago. All right. Who installed this? All right. I'll just speak. I'll just speak <laughs> yeah, who, who's Madam responsible Chair. for this awful microphone? Uh, Madam Chair and Ranking Member Dreyer, members, of committee, thank you years. very much for for letting us join you today and mm -hmm. offer our comments. I'm going to take advantage of the chair's kind offer to let us submit our uh, formal remarks Absolutely. for the record. And then if I might just take a couple of minutes to talk about this bill. <clears throat> this bill spends a trillion dollars and creates vast and powerful new bureaucracies. Let me just talk about one of those bureaucracies and one of those bureaucrats that is created in this legislation. I went through and in the part of the legislation that falls under Mr. Miller and I's jurisdiction, I start tabbing places where the Health Choices Commissioner is assigned responsibilities and given powers. For, let me, for example, let me just read a few of them. Here, right here, page 9, it says the term dependent has the meaning given such term by the commissioner. And it includes a spouse. The commissioner gets to define that term dependent. Page 99. Got, the commissioner's got to submit a, submit a report. Such report shall include any recommendations the commissioner deems appropriate. And on pages 100 and 101, the commissioner determines what a qualified health benefits plan is. It says that plan shall comply with standards established by the commissioner. Qualified health benefits plans that use the provider network for items and services shall meet such standards respecting provider networks as the commissioner may decide. And on page 121, again, the commissioner establishes exchange participating health plans. And on page 133, it says here the commissioner is responsible for the establishment of qualified health benefits plan standards, the establishment and operation of health insurance exchange, and the administration of individual affordability credits. This is all one bureaucrat, Madam Chair. Page 134, the commissioner shall collect data for the purposes of carrying out the commissioner's duties. On page 157, says here that uh, the terms employer, employee, full-time employee, and part-time employee have the meaning given such terms by the commissioner. And on page uh, 172, the commissioner shall establish standards necessary to implement the requirements of the title. 
Page 173, the commission shall deny excessive premiums and premium increases. The point, Madam Chair and committee members, that we have created a super bureaucrat here who can define, deny, deem, determine, assess, establish, and administer. This is an enormously powerful individual that we're creating in statute here. It's no wonder Americans are worried about a government takeover. It must be his own. How can they not be? I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Barton, let's go ahead with you. Thank you, um, mm -hmm. Madam Chairwoman, Ranking Member Dreyer, and other members of the committee. Um, I think it's symbolic that I'm at the right of this panel. If uh, when Mr. Waxman gets here, you put him down at the left, we'll have a, a perfect metaphysical symbol of this debate. It doesn't look you know, that way from here, by the way. Uh, to be honest with you, there may be an open mind in this crowd. I, I'm not sure of it, but let's see. Well, we hope you being right in the middle, Madam Chairwoman, are that open mind. Of course. Of course. Without question. I do appreciate the opportunity to uh, testify here at the Rules Committee, the Distinguished Rules Committee. Uh, on the uh, health care bill, which uh, uh, we expect to come to the floor in the very near future. Before I get to the substance of uh, my testimony on the actual bill, I think it's interesting to uh, see what happened today. We announced an unemployment rate of 10.2 percent, which is up. We also have been able to compare the two CBO scores from the last bills that came out of committee and this bill that's been released this week. In the two CBO scores, we see that the number of uninsured citizens uh, has gone up under the CBO scores from 8.5 million to 12 million, while at the same time, the number of uninsured illegal aliens decreases from 8.5 million to 6 million. Millions of more Americans are unemployed today, according to the Department of Labor. According to the CBO, millions more of uninsured citizens compared to the previous bill that was released and millions fewer uninsured illegal aliens. That doesn't sound to me like very good health policy. But as to the reason that we're here today, we're here to consider 3962. Uh, the first bill was a thousand page bill. This bill is closing in on 2000 pages. Without the changes that we know are going to be made uh, in the uh, committee rule. So, the first thing that I'd like to ask, Madam Chairwoman and members of the committee, is that the eight Republican amendments that were accepted at the Energy and Commerce Committee that have been stripped from this bill be reinserted. Now, Chairman Waxman is not here, but uh, if he were here, he would. I think he would back me up. Of these eight, he supported all but maybe one. There may have been one of these eight amendments that he opposed, but the others he accepted. So it's puzzling that, uh, that they're not in this bill. I'm going to just briefly summarize those eight amendments. <coughs> one was a Boyer amendment uh, dealing with veterans' issues that would allow the, ve the veteran that was en enrolled in a VA health care, TRICARE system, to obtain coverage through the new health insurance exchange in addition to their VA or their TRICARE package. The second one is a Burgess Amendment, which would ensure that all qualified health plans under the bill have a reasonable and accessible utilization review and appeals process. The third was a Whitfield Amendment uh, dealing with a moratorium on reimbursement cuts uh, to the ambulatory surgical setting procedure. The fourth was a Rogers Amendment that would have prevented the federal government and private insurance from using federal comparative effectiveness research for care rationing or limiting reimbursement levels. Dr. Gingrey had an amendment uh, that said that the government could not dictate to physicians uh, how to practice medicine. Uh, Mr. Shimkus, and this is one that I really don't understand being struck, Mr. Shimkus, who is a, a Christian scientist, had an amendment accepted at committee which would add language ensuring that there is no religious discrimination for patients seeking spiritual care under plans in the new health insurance exchange. As we all know, uh, Christian scientists do not believe in the traditional practice of medicine, and they have uh, their own separate medical facilities. Uh, Mr. Shimkus's amendment would have 
allowed that to continue. That amendment was struck. Uh, Mr. Walden had an amendment that would have ensured that the demographics of the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission more accurately reflect the demographics of Medicare recipients. Mr. Walden had another amendment that it would have ensured that the new Health Benefits Advisory Committee established in the Democratic legislation accurately represents the interests of rural Americans. That amendment was also struck. So I would hope that those amendments would either be made in order or put into some sort of an amendment that is folded in to the bill. I would also ask uh, that a Republican substitute be made in order. We do have an alternative that Congressman Camp has talked about. Uh, I think it is truly an alternative, uh, and it should be considered. And finally, I hope that you allow enough time for debate uh, with 435 members uh, on an issue that is arguably the most important issue this Congress is going to uh, debate. Uh, we should have enough floor time so that every member that wishes to speak uh, can speak. And so I would, I would ask uh, for more than the normal time for the debate. Again, it's always an honor to come before the Rules Committee, uh, and I thank you for your consideration. You're very welcome. Let me just state first that the Republican substitute is certainly going to be allowed, and we plan on a great deal more uh, debate time than usual. Gentlemen, first, I, I really want to say how proud I am of the, of the three committees, uh, Republicans and Democrats, who work so hard on those committees. And uh, I think that your work will stand for generations to come. It's some of the best that's ever been done in the Congress, and we're very proud of that. But there have always been, uh, all the way back to Teddy Roosevelt, the people who simply just said no, uh, people who seem not to notice what was going on out in the country. I don't know about the rest of you, but I have an awful lot of people in my district that are losing their jobs, some of them in the middle of cancer treatment, who we had to give that up because they can no longer afford it. Uh, the stories that we get almost daily are almost uh, unbelievable that in America, in this country, that we would not be able to provide the health care to people to simply to keep them alive. The time has really come for us to make this change. And I, I really want to ask my Republican friends, and you are, what did you do in the last 12 years to try to alleviate this issue yourselves? I would. We actually had a lot of reforms. When I first got on the Ways and Means Committee, there was no preventative care in Medicare. That was a Republican reform to start having cancer screening, physicals. We also passed a prescription drug benefit, Medicare Part D, which now seniors don't have to choose between food and their medicine. We also Except passed... Except for the donut hole. We passed... We get coverage to millions of seniors, and if you do a poll and ask seniors, they're happy with their coverage. And not only that, if we had followed what the, the then minority wanted to do and mandated a premium level at $35, seniors are able to get that Part D coverage at much less than the Dingle Amendment, which would have required a set floor premium. And so what we want to do is, and, and, and thirdly, let me just say, health savings accounts have been a real advantage for people who want to have some control over their health care, want to take some personal stake in their health care and save tax-free. So we've had a number of improvements in health care while we were in the majority. We believe our substitute would, would continue on that and is also a first step toward comprehensive health reform to make sure that more people have coverage, but also can do it at a price they can afford. Uh, as of yesterday, uh, you didn't know the price tag on your bill. Do you have that today? Or maybe it was just Mr. Boehner? No, we have, a, we have CBO scoring on our bill. Our bill, does not raise, our bill does not raise the deficit. We actually lower the deficit mm -hmm. by uh, just over $60 billion. What does it cost? Well, we do two things. We, we have lawsuit reform in our bill, which scores savings of about $54 billion. But that's only 1% of the cost. We, we use that, we use that, uh, those savings uh, to be able to lower premiums. So mm -hmm. our bill is not the, in so anywhere. So you lower premiums 1%, basically. No, we, we, we lower them much more than that. We lower them about 10% if you're in the small business market, which is where most people are losing their health care. So we actually help in that very vital part of of health insurance. I think our bill scores is a cost savings of $68 billion, some of the things that Congressman um, Camp talked about, mm -hmm. and it has um, um, 
increases in spending of about $61 billion. <coughs> so over a 10-year period, it would save about $8 billion. You save $8 billion? It would save about $8 billion, eight. according to the CBO. And we save how much over 10 years? No, the net reduction is over 60 okay. in our bill. Over 10 years. Over 10 years. About $100 billion. Uh, Madam Chair, I, mm -hmm. I would find it very difficult to find someone that is more easy to work with than uh, the ranking member of Ways and Means. Mm -hmm. We had hoped that we could do a lot of exciting things together uh, in a bipartisan way. Could you speak into the mic a little bit more, Mr. Rankin? Thank you. Okay. Yeah. What I was saying is that I, 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 I found it very easy to work with uh, uh, Dave Camp, and we had both hoped that uh, that we would be able to work together on a lot of bipartisan mm -hmm. issues, and I'm confident that soon we would be forced to do just that. Uh, having said that, we both have been restricted because we have not been able to get that atmosphere within the House that we have for a long time enjoyed within the committee. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was hoping that there would be a substitute that would be the Republican substitute mm -hmm. so that it would afford us the opportunity to have debate. But uh, until this week, I, I did not know uh, that there was something that was there to work with, and I just would want the record to indicate, since this is really a historic occasion, um, that... Um, had I had known that the Republican leadership was prepared to offer a substitute, I think that would have made uh, this moment even more exciting than it is. I see. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Pallone, are you here for Mr. Waxman? Yes. You have a statement or not? I do. A, you do. Yes. We'd love to hear it. <laughs> no, I'm fine. I, um, I'm just pinch hitting on two minutes notice, but... Well, we appreciate I, your coming. Thank you not, very much. I would like to enter the statement into the record because I certainly don't want to uh, bore you with reading it. Without objection. Uh, but I'd also like to uh, make a few comments if I could beyond that. Um, I know that... Uh, is that microphone on? I guess it is not, madam. No, it it doesn't show much of a light. Oh. Madam Chair, if, if I might, I, I, I just, I mean, the gentleman has just indicated that he's here on two minutes notice. Yes, we, but I've been working I, on this. No, I know years. you, I know the gentleman, and this is meant, in no way, in no way is this meant as a slight to Mr. Waxman, but uh, Mr. Waxman has provided such leadership on this, and we have Messrs. Wrangle and Miller here, and I just wondered, is there a problem or anything that we should know about because we were hoping to have the three chairmen and the three ranking members here. And you just said you got you too much. You'd just like to move to might... questions? Is that what you're... I, I just wondered if we might be enlightened as to why Mr. Waxman is not here. Oh, I don't know the answer to that. Um, well, we, but we're glad to have Mr. Pallone. <laughs> right. Well, we are. Because we do need, uh, need to hear from you. Let me, let, let me just summarize very briefly and say that, um, I mean, obviously, certainly for me, this is the most important piece of legislation that I've ever been part of. And... And I, and I would like everyone to know that we've worked long and hard and had many hearings in my health subcommittee on this bill. Uh, I, I can't reiterate them now, but literally um, several weeks, maybe six, seven weeks that we had hearings on the legislation and then many uh, subsequent meetings. And there was certainly an effort to make it a bipartisan bill. I know that that didn't work out that way, but I know there were many efforts to, to try to accomplish that. And um, I think the, the, the most important thing that I can stress right now is not only that we believe uh, that this bill goes uh, as far as possible to achieve uh, universal coverage, but at the same time, it is so crucial for those who actually have uh, health insurance now, either through their employer or, or, some, or through some other means, uh, because it really, I think, in the long run is going to make uh, health insurance a lot more affordable. And that at the same time, we have all these protections. And what I really hear more than anything else uh, right now from my constituents, if I could say to all of you, 
is people who just, um, you know, are denied coverage because they have pre-existing conditions or they have coverage and they realize it doesn't cover much or, you know, their policy is rescinded when they get sick or they find out that, um, uh, you know, that uh, it, they have to only, in, in the course of a year, it only pays so much or in the course of a lifetime it pays so much. So I don't want to take away in any way from the affordability issue or from the fact that we're providing coverage to something like 96% of Americans. But I really need to stress that for so many people now, they just find that their coverage is denied or that uh, their coverage is a lot more limited than they realize because of all these discriminatory practices that would be eliminated in the bill. So I'll, I'll rest with that and, and, and urge you obviously to uh, move forward with the legislation, which is probably the most important uh, piece of legislation I'll ever see here. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. I, I think a lot of us remember the Clinton health care bill of recent memory, uh, where I learned for the first time that there is a lifetime cap. And, uh, because, and I learned rather graphically by a young man, uh, not even in his teens, who had a very serious head trauma. Uh, within less than a year, he had used up his full allotment. He had reached his cap. And that young man is not insurable in the United States to this day. And one of the most important things I think that we can do is remove those caps so that we don't have numbers of people who then become the responsibility of all of us. And I don't think we need to lose any of the fact that each one of us in our premiums pay about a thousand dollars more for the uninsured, which will go away with this. Would your chairwoman just yield one? I more will. Minute? You know, I, I know this is um, uh, on another topic, but it's clearly related. You know, I know you worked for almost 12 or 14 years on that genetic discrimination bill, I did. 13. which was finally signed into law. And you know, I have to tell you, just in the last six months, I have had so many people that have come up to me, and we're so grateful. That that's now the law because as that as as you know technology improves more and more discrimination was beginning to take place based on genetics 20 percent and merit. um that was so important to so many people i cannot stress it enough and this is this is uh basically taking the same idea and and applying it across the board to so all this kind of discriminatory uh you know risk analysis Absolutely. so I can't stress that enough, and, I, and again, I, I'm, I'm not saying it because you're presiding here today, Madam Chairwoman, but I just think... Well, it will help you a lot. It is so... <laughs> it, it, was, it, it was the precursor for, a lot, for what we're trying to do here across the board. Well, we had yeah. lots of help. Madam Chair, yes. uh, if I might try to help myself also. Uh, Please. I want to just say that I agree with your last point. Uh, on the annual and lifetime cap. Yes. I think that's important. Our bill also prohibits what we've annual and lifetime caps on policies. So in that sense, we have those provisions in common. We also prohibit oh. the rescission. We have this, mm -hmm. like, the language present spoken about the language that initially got into the bill last year. One of the things that uh, I think is important, and we all know that no matter what CBO scores, they cannot score a saving. So even with the genetics and what we're able to do, we cut down on invasive surgeries and hospital stays, and uh, it's going to make a major difference, and it's going to be a great deal less expensive than, than what we do now. And we see that throughout this bill. Uh, and I, I thank you again for all the innovations that you all put in. Would you like to say just a word about in this bill what you're doing for research and for the future? For research, or you mean with regard to this discriminatory well, policy? Well, that and, and in your, no, just what, what you're doing in your part of the health bill to ensure uh, innovative ideas and techniques and for saving more Well, money. I think one of the things, I mean, there's so many things in here that, um, you know, exist in terms of innovation. You know, there's the medical home model, which is mm -hmm. encouraged. There is um, um, basically uh, every effort to do preventative type services. I mean, look, the way we're going to save money in the, both in the short and in the long run is by basically encouraging prevention and wellness mm -hmm. because if people get preventative care and they can go to see uh, a doctor on a regular basis then they don't end up in an emergency room or end up hospitalized or in a nursing home which costs the federal government you know billions of extra dollars yes. 
So, I mean, there's a lot of innovation, but I think the main thing I would stress is the whole idea of, of prevention and wellness to get people care so they don't, you know, end up getting sicker. And, uh, I, you know, CBO has scored some of this, but in, in my opinion, not enough. I, I believe that the CBO numbers you're getting, which, you know, bring us under the 900 billion, uh, you know, they're very limited in the, what they look at. I think in the long run, you're going to save trillions of dollars because of all the preventative measures and all the innovation that exists yes. in this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you all, gentlemen. Did you want to say something? I, I really did because I learned so much uh, in the process of having my plan participate in the drafting of the bill. Uh, you know, the Secretary of Health and Human Services and the Former head of the NIH said at a meeting with some of you were there uh, that 80 percent of the persons on Lipitor are not helped by it. So that with genetics we can get the proper medication, the individual medication, which we do a great deal, I think, of in this bill. All right, thank you all very much. Madam Chair, Mr. Could Dreyer. I, could I ask a question? I know it's sure a, you can. When do you expect to put your rule on the floor for consideration? Tomorrow. What do you know at time? I do not know the exact time. Whatever uh, Mr. Uh, Hoyer decides that. Okay. But we'll be ready. Uh, right. we'll Madam be ready. Chair, I have Mr. too many notes uh, for the, uh, the so-called docs bill. Uh -huh. is, is that going to be considered today? Madam yes, it is. Separately from this bill. Do you want to testify on that as well? I would. All right. Well, we have to finish this one first, and then we'll send for you if you'd like us to. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Mr. Randall, if your colleagues don't mind, my, I'm being told that you may go ahead and testify on that, even though we are not on that bill, which is a strange thing, but have at it. All right. Uh, I'm here also, uh, members of the committee, and uh, this year to uh, support including the Medical Physician Payment Reform Act, H.R. 3961. Uh, in this rule, uh, fixing America's support physician payment system will strengthen the Medicare uh, program, but it is still a critical part of reforming the country's uh, health uh, care system. Uh, unless the Congress acts, uh, the medical physician payment rates will be cut more than 20% uh, next year and by 40% over the next five years, if allowed to go through these cuts, will have a devastating effect in, uh, in, uh, upon doctors, nurses, and other providers. It could leave the Medicare program in droves because of lack of uh, a compensation. And so we're hoping uh, that the beneficiaries will not have to be forced to see alternative, more expensive sources of care, such as the use of our emergency rooms around the country. Indeed, it would have a negative effect on the entire health care system uh, since TRICARE, which serves our nation's troops and their families, and many private insurance companies base their payments on Medicare. So we have an obligation to make certain that our seniors and disabled continue to have access to the care that they need and doctors be fairly compensated for the important work that they do. Uh, what this legislation would do, Madam Chair, is to repeal the Medicare's broken physician payments formula and replace it with a stable system that ends the cycle of short-term fixes followed by the threat of even deeper cuts and the President of the United States will support this effort. The new payment system provides needed support for the primary care workforce and encourages all physicians to improve quality but also holds doctors accountable for their spending growth, which more or less is a reform 
a system that we have applied to the uh, physicians. Uh, this legislation follows the president's lead by ending uh, the budget gimmick that assumes uh, physicians' pay rates will be cut by 40% over the next several years. It also complies with the pay issue of budget rules that the House has put in place earlier this year. Uh, this legislation has received the support of the AMA and uh, other major physician groups. And uh, even though the health reform and physician payment reform bills will be voted on separately, the House is committed to make certain that this permanent, comprehensive uh, physician payment reform is enacted as long as soon as possible. So we have found it inseparable uh, to make certain that we provide for reimbursement of our physicians and at the same time put this additional burden on the providers uh, under our reform system. So I hope the committee, even though we voted on this separately, on the floor might consider it at this time. Thank you very much. Mr. Camp, you'd like to rebut that? Uh, well, just to say that uh, a long-term solution to the physician payment problem is, is critical. But I also think it's critical that we not do something that isn't paid for. And uh, I haven't... We can't. <laughs> I know you can't. Yeah. This committee... No, that's all. It's but I, 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 think, I think to add between 200 and $250 billion to the deficit, certainly we need to make sure that we address this, mm -hmm. this cliff that physicians face every year, every couple of years. But I, I'm concerned that we're not doing it in a fiscally responsible way because it will increase the deficit by well over $200 billion, and I have serious concerns with that approach. Are you aware that Peter Orzak, I think you mentioned him, I wasn't going to bring this up, but uh, said in a speech at NYU that of the $9 trillion deficit that we are facing, $600 trillion of it is attributable to the 2003 Medicare reform bill, of which not a dime was paid, and the tax cuts. Uh, that's over well over two thirds of the money that we're facing. Uh, we have made major changes here in pay as you go, uh, and with this bill, for example, is totally paid for by law under the Paygo law. Mr. Plum? I mean, this is also within our jurisdiction, so I can just mm -hmm. Certainly. say the following. Um, you know, I, I have to say, I've been watching this for many years. Mm -hmm. And we end up with this process where the end of the year, under successive Republican Congresses, and now under Democratic, that we always say we're going to fix it. We're going to fix it sometime. Yeah. We never do. We do this fix at the end of the year to prevent this cliff. I think it's going to be 21% reduction scheduled for this January. And um, I think what you're doing here with this legislation is being responsible and saying, look, the reality is. We're going to continue to do this every year. It does end up being a uh, deficit. It has been under Republican administrations. And it, let's, let's just be honest now and say that we're not going to cut positions 20% at the end of the year. And we're going to put in a permanent reform proposal that makes sense and, and is practical in terms of making sure that physicians take Medicare patients. And if we don't do this, they're not going to take Medicare patients. That's what's happening in, in my district. More and more physicians say, I won't take Medicare because they see this roller coaster ride that we've been going through every year under Republican administrations and now under us as well. So I just think the Democrats are essentially being responsible here and saying, look, the reality is this is the way this is going to have to be paid for. And this is an important part of what we present to seniors because, you know, seniors are coming to us and saying, what are you doing about Medicare in this bill? Well, we're going to get, we're going to change this ridiculous system where doctors don't know if they're going to get paid and therefore, the doctors will take you. So this is an important issue for senior citizens as well as for our hospitals. I can't stress enough. And, um, you know, I, I know that, uh, you know, some of my colleagues on the other side are going to raise the pay for it, but they did it the same way. And this is the only way it's going to happen in a meaningful way. Thank you very much. I, I would just say we did not increase the deficit. We didn't do a long-term fix. We did short-term fixes, but they were all paid for. That, that, I just mm -hmm. have to correct that for the record. Mm -hmm. Madam Chairman, I need Mr. Barton? Well, I agree with some of what Chairman Rangel and Subcommittee Chairman Plone said on problem identification. This is a problem. We need to fix it. But I strongly disagree with the solution. It is a sham. You know, what you're doing, 
in the budget resolution said it doesn't have to be paid for, so you're taking an eraser and wiping that away, and then you're basically doing the same system again, except you now have a regional index instead of a national index. Until you hold physicians accountable individually or at least locally for in, in some sort of a system that's transparent and they are accountable individually, an individual doctor is never going to say because the national target is X billions of dollars, I'm going to operate my practice differently. And that's what the current system does and that's what this new system that you're trying to implement does. So let's don't be under any misunderstanding here. We need to fix physician reimbursement under Medicare. I agree with the chairman and the subcommittee chairman. I agree with that. But if you're really going to fix it, let's fix it. Let's throw away this index that's based on the consumer price index and national inflation, which has almost nothing to do with medical inflation. Let's use Dr. Burgess's idea of using a medical index, a medical inflation index, a medical and equipment inflation index. Let's make local physicians uh, accountable. Uh, let's put real transparency into the system. And then let's figure out a way to pay for it. But what this bill does is simply wipe away the debt that's been accrued. And you can argue, and Chairman Rangel and Mr. Pallone may argue, that that's really not a debt because the money's already been spent and it was kind of an artificial target anyway. I'll have that debate. But if we're going to change the system, let's really change it, let's really fix it, and let's work on it on a bipartisan basis. And the reason they're putting it as a separate bill, which is another, I think, a political gimmick, is because it doesn't score as a part of the overall score that President Obama said we want to hold it under 900 billion, or whatever it is. If you take two to three hundred billion out in a separate bill, technically you're in compliance. So let's let's let this committee and the American people at least understand what's going on on this. But again, we don't disagree that it needs to be fixed. But we think it, we the Republicans think it really ought to be fixed. Uh, Madam Chair, the last thing. I thought would come up as we the Republicans and we the Democrats because, as you know, I have not been chair that long and the Democrats have not been in charge that long. And I really thought this is the way you people did this for the eight years preceding our majority. So I guess it's time to change the whole system, but give us a few more years and then we'll talk about it. Let's work together. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman, and uh, welcome to, uh, to all of you. Uh, at the end of last week, this bill was uh, introduced, and um, we are now holding the first and only hearing that will um, be held at all on this issue. And that's why uh, it is so important for us to be here today. It was just a few days ago on Wednesday that we had the manager's amendment uh, put forward and um, it was done in response to what happened in this committee on the 24th of June when at 3 o'clock in the morning my friend Mr. McGovern was reading the motion to move uh, a special rule to the floor that would allow for consideration of the cap and trade bill and um, I had a 300 page amendment that was put in front of me as the motion was being read. And following that, for the first time, the American people decided to um, get enraged over a procedural issue, that being the fact that we had not taken the time to read the bill. And so correctly, Speaker Pelosi responded by saying that there would be three days provided for members to look at this legislation before it's considered. So the manager's amendment to this legislation was introduced on Wednesday. And um, the unfortunate thing is that that is being violated right now because as we have continued to see press reports and to hear uh, this manager's amendment is changing. Now, uh, if the manager's amendment is finalized in the next day or two when we have this vote next Tuesday or next Thursday, it is quite possible that there could be compliance with that uh, layover requirement. But the American people have sent a very clear and strong message. They believe that we should take time to look at legislation. That's why it is very unusual uh, for us 
on what Mr. Pallone has directly described as uh, the most important legislation that he's dealt with to have the one and only committee to act on this being the House Rules Committee. And so we're sitting here doing something that, again, is very unique. It is fascinating to have listened to, uh, to all of you testify. And I will say again that I'm very sorry that Mr. Waxman, who's been such a, a critical player in this, is not here. And I hope that everything is all right. And again, this is no slight to you, Mr. Pallone, but I was looking forward to having him join us along with the other two chairs and ranking members. But it was fascinating to listen to the testimony provided. Um, it is clear, I believe, that the American people have, as Mr. Camp said, spoken, and they want to ensure that we don't put into place legislation that is going to kill jobs, cut Medicare, raise the debt on our children, um, raise health care costs, raise uh, potentially provide funding for uh, abortion through the federal government to dramatically expand the number of people who are in this country illegally benefiting from this program. The American people don't want that. It's very clear that they don't. And then, uh, as the testimony was completed, the distinguished chair of the committee began posing questions to the panel. And I was struck with those questions. The first was um, the fact that nothing had been done when we were in the majority to deal with the issue of health care. And in fact, Mr. Camp very correctly pointed to the expansion of medical savings accounts, to the fact that we brought about for seniors the opportunity through Part D to um, see affordable prescription drugs placed for them. There were a number of reforms put into place that have been very important that we have continued to push. And so the sense that some people have put out there that we Republicans want to do nothing is a preposterous argument. And I'm very gratified that, in fact, the White House has just begun criticizing our Republican <laughs> plan. Why? Because for the first time, they are acknowledging that we have, in fact, come forward with a plan. Because heretofore, it was just the Republicans were nothing but the party of no. When we've had this litany of proposals on a wide range of things that, frankly, I believe, create the potential for broad bipartisan support. Again, to the questions raised by the distinguished chair of the panel. I, I mean, uh, I, was, I was struck with the issue of pre-existing conditions. She gave a very compelling argument about a case of an individual with a pre-existing condition. We all want to make sure that we effectively deal with the problem of pre-existing conditions. And the caps, as we discussed, as Mr. Camp again said, very important to realize that this is not an issue that is being ignored by anyone. So it really has saddened me that the debate itself has come to the point where we have um, either you are for this package, meaning you're for reform, or if you're not for this package, it means you're opposed to reform, which again, is a, a ludicrous claim, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm gratified that we've started to, to move on that uh, and recognize that we do have a package which, frankly, I believe, with the very compelling arguments that have been put forward by the three ranking members who are here, should enjoy bipartisan support. Mr. Rangel has just spoken about bipartisanship, and I think that we found some common area here. The distinguished chair of the committee asked questions, and she didn't have a response to the very, very, very thoughtful uh, proposals that we worked on. We do address these questions that the American people want us to address in the substitute that we have put forward. I also want to say that I'm uh, very pleased that we have um, cameras in the room. Now, uh, I was privileged at the end of the 109th Congress to have wired this room for cameras. Uh, I didn't personally do it, but under the direction of our staff director, Mr. Halpern, uh, we had uh, all of the um, technical stuff put into place so that we could, in fact, have cameras in the room. Did you install the every sound system? Have every yeah, single... Are you responsible for yes. those microphones? Uh, no, no, that was, we, waited, we waited to let you take care of that one. Well, we, but I assure we you, got I assure no you, fingerprints Chair, on those microphones. I assure, well, Madam Chair, uh, you've been in charge for three years. You can do what you want to the sound system. But what, what, what I'd recommend is, as you're improving the sound system, you might do something that every single one of these members have in their committees, and every single committee in this institution save the Intelligence Committee and the Committee on Standards of Official Conduct, which obviously holds secret meetings, has. And that is an opportunity for the American people to see what takes place in this committee. I remember when I first uh, 
came on as a member of the Rules Committee a long time ago, two decades ago. The dean of the Washington Press Corps, uh, David Broder, once said to me, uh, he said, you know, there's a reason that you all meet in that crowded little room up there on the third floor. Mr. Broder said to me, it's to keep us out of the room. And the one thing that the American people have said they want is uh, a degree of transparency so they can see the work take place here. So our colleague, Mr. Dent uh, from Pennsylvania, has uh, introduced a resolution uh, calling for the um, installation of these cameras, which could be done very, very easily. So I'm gratified that they're here. And I say this with the cameras in the room because I know that the work product from the Ways and Means Committee and the Education and Labor Committee and the Energy and Commerce Committee uh, is improved because of the fact that the American people were able to respond to what goes on in your committee. I mean, we've had the cameras here on three occasions in this Congress. First, for the so-called stimulus bill, the one that we were told would not see the unemployment rate exceed 8% if it was implemented. And uh, as we've all discussed and found, the unemployment rate is tragically today at 10.2%. Second was the budget resolution. And uh, the, uh, what was the, what was the third? I guess this is the third one. This is the third one. This is the third one. We had, uh, well, gentlemen, and yield. of course I'm happy to yield this we to the chair. We have Turn down a request from and Madam Chair. If I could reclaim my time, I will tell you that I will tell you that we want. Madam, if I could reclaim my time, Madam Chair, I'm happy well, to say that we would. Nice I, you let me finish I, I heard your statement. Your statement is that we've never denied cameras. Of course, That's the rules true. of the House, as you know, Madam Chair, the rules of the House prohibit you from forbidding a camera crew from coming into this room. Well, the point is, I'm happy to further yield. <laughs> That's quite all right. I just was wondering if you were going to get back to health care. Madam Chair, uh, am I uh, not allowed to talk about the circumstances around no, which we're No, you may talk about anything you want. Thank you very because much, Madam Chair. Because those are the rules of the rules committee. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. We, I, I was just that. curiosity that Th drove me to that question. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Yeah. I appreciate that. Let me say that um, we want to ensure that people have an opportunity on a daily basis to see what goes on in the Rules Committee. For example, last summer, we began an unprecedented structure for consideration of the appropriations bills. We had, uh, as we all know, a trillion dollars in spending, and it was done for the first time in the 220-year history of the United States of America by shutting down the appropriations process. Never had that been done before, and we did not have one opportunity for the cameras to be here to see this. And so I implore you, uh, Madam Chair, to do what all of these chairmen have done, and that is allow an opportunity for the cameras to um, be actually uh, placed into this room. So let me uh, say that we are going to uh, raise a number of important questions. Mr. Camp, you look like you'd like to respond to. Well, I, I, just, well I was just going to say on the physician payment bill, H.R. 3961, that legislation has not been through the Committee on Ways and Means. We've not been an, had an opportunity to review that in open hearing in committee to offer amendments to, to go through it line by line. So this is a legislation that is coming straight to the floor. It's an important... So basically we have two bills before us that fall in that exact category because as we know the over 2,000 page uh, health care bill that we're addressing with this manager's amendment which is continually being changed in violation of the commitment that there would be three days to be provided has not gone through your committee. It's not gone through any committee other than being considered here on the Rules Committee in the same way on the, the doc fix well, bills. We, we had a markup in the summer over a thousand page health care bill. And that's not the bill that we're considering then, today. And then now it's a two thousand page bill which we have not had a chance to have commit, open committee hearings where the public is allowed to be invited and cameras are allowed to, 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 to uh, broadcast. On the, on the second thousand pages or on the manager's amendment. That's exactly right. So, I, I mean, I, I will just say that, uh, again, Madam Chair, I believe that the American people have spoken very strongly. They first and foremost do not want to see the government take over health care, but they do want us to implement positive reforms to deal with a problem that every single member of this House, Democrat and Republican alike, acknowledges exists. And uh, <clears throat> I would like to think that as we proceed through the next uh, several hours, even though announcements were made that no amendments are going to be made in order other than the, the substitute that goes back to a statement that was made a week ago today by Mr. Miller and then statements made earlier this week by Mrs. Slaughter, um, 
I, I, um, I hope that that does change because I think that we can, in fact, take uh, positive action to address the need that is there. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Mr. Madam McGovern. Chair. Yes, Mr. Rank. I would just like to say that uh, this provision, in, in terms of fixing the doctor's uh, compensation, was a part of the base bill that it was reported out of the Ways and Means Committee. That's HR 3200. Mm -hmm. And as you know, the uh, decided that we were going to blend the bills that were reported out of the other two committees. Which was always the intent, I understand. Does so anybody else sure. want to comment? Well, that just shows that your bills are reported out and grown in spending so that you had to separate this bill to keep it under the school. I agree that it was in his face until it came out of the original. But, but the, the committee yeah. never considered a standalone bill, and, and I'm sure this rules committee here. would understand it's a very different prospect mm -hmm. than to have. Well, it is. I mean, that's why, that's why I'm arguing that, that we have two bills before us, and again, we had H.R. 3200, we had the 1,000-page bill that emerged from the Ways and Means Committee, different legislation, and this is, again, the first opportunity that we've had here. Yes, Mr. Pallone. Well, I just wanted to stress that we had countless hearings on the, right. the doctor's fix, on every aspect of this bill. And, you know, the fact that maybe it's a separated into two bills, I mean, you can say whatever you want, but I mean, I don't want anybody to suggest that there haven't been months and years of hearings on this and every aspect of this yeah. bill. And, it, and, and what Mr. Rangel said about it coming out of uh, Ways and Means is also true for energy and Well, Mr. Plone, you're absolutely right that for years and years and years, we've been discussing this, and we've gone through the litany of actions yeah. that were taken in the last several Congresses to deal with whether we it was expansion of medical savings accounts, whether it was dealing with the, the, the doc fix, other issues. We have dealt with those in committee in the past, but this measure that is before us with a manager's amendment, the likes of which we don't know will you know, exist as at the end of the day, uh, is what we're trying to address, and this is the one and only hearing on this. But if the gentleman, I mean, look, sure. we had legislative hearings on this issue. It wasn't just that. On the issue, I understand. Oh, of course, I acknowledge. Of course you did. We've had legislative hearings on the issue of health care uh, since the beginning of time. It has been an issue that has been discussed at great length by a wide range of people. Since we're discussing this issue of uh, jurisdiction, Madam Chair, I'd, I'd like to inquire of you um, whether... Uh, you can explain to us why it is a provision that is included in this bill dealing with the cost containment trigger that was put into place when we passed the Medicare Part D measure uh, is there. It has, um, I understand that you're completely repealing, you're completely repealing this provision, Madam Chair, but there is language that actually says, um, the subtitle is to be restored as if such subtitle had never been enacted. And to me, this is a very confusing measure here, as if it was never enacted. When we called on the uh, Medicare Trust Fund, the board, to report to us if there, we, the cost level was exceeded, and now, unfortunately, we're, we're in a position where this measure has been provided and no one understands exactly why it is that they would come to the conclusion that we would say that uh, it was as if this subtitle never existed at all. And I wonder if you might enlighten us on this I'd one, be Chair. happy to. I'd be delighted to. Uh, the uh, House bill increases the solvency of the Medicare Trust Fund by five years. The House is doing what the trigger was designed to do, and we don't need it. Well, Madam Chair, let me just say, you're, you're making a unilateral decision here. Not at all. We, a unilateral decision I, that, not, no, that we, that we these that, people Madam for Chair, increasing that we, it that we, don't, that we don't need it, when in fact, this is a stopgap that was put there that would have a, simply a report come to us by the Board of Trustees of Medicare, and they were to come to us with this report, and we're now saying that every report that they've ever provided never existed with this language that is here. That's what it says. Mr. Dry, it's as if the subtitle had never far, been enacted. You're welcome to do it. You're okay, let, okay do Madam it. Chair, if you say yeah. that I'm reaching too far, let me read to you the language, if uh, I may. The language and you tell of? me, you can tell me, that's in this bill. Yes. Uh, the language that's in this bill. It says, 
uh, such subtitle is to be restored as if such subtitle had never been enacted. And so the action that we are proposing to take in this says that the request that was made for the Medicare Board of Trustees to report back to this institution as to whether or not we had exceeded the spending level, that it never happened. And what I'm asking you is, is why is it that that provision was put in place? And incidentally, this provision falls within the jurisdiction of not the Ways and Means, Education and Labor, or the Energy and Commerce Committee, but within the jurisdiction of the House Rules Committee. My, I have the same answer. When you increase the life of Medicare five years, obviously no trigger is needed. Thank you, Madam That's Chair. That's our job. You're welcome. Mr. McGovern. Uh, thank you very much. And um, I want to thank the, uh, the panel for being here and for your patience uh, and for all of your work, uh, uh, both on the Democratic side and the Republican side. I want to thank the staffs um, who have spent more hours on this than we have. And uh, this has been a long process. But so there's no misunderstanding, um, I want to make clear that I think this has been a transparent and a deliberate process. Uh, the Democrats have held uh, 100 hearings on health care since 2007. We've heard from 181 witnesses, both Democratic witnesses and Republican witnesses. Three committees have spent 160 hours on hearings and markups on, on health care legislation. We spent 83 hours uh, in, um, in committee in markups. There were a total of 239 amendments considered, of which 121 were approved. Uh, the three bills that are where kind of merging here were, were marked up in July more than three months ago. Full text of these bills, of the bills have, has been available since October 29th. And, um, and, and, I, and I say that because when I hear my friends criticize the process, I, I, I have to compare it to the process you had when you were in charge. And we're talking about the Medicare prescription drug bill. Um, with, regard, with regard to hearings of, of, uh, of the five health hearings on 2000, in 2003 prior to consideration of the Medicare Modernization Act, only one was on the topic of prescription drug coverage, and that was the only hearing in the full committee. There was never a hearing on the proposal itself. My friends talk about the cost. That bill, uh, we could argue the, the benefits and the negatives of that bill. I think the donut hole is a negative, but is, you know, it was not paid for and it's costing between 400 and 500 billion dollars. That's a lot of money. And so when people talk about the need to be mindful of the deficit and the debt, I, I, just, I just point that out to you. Uh, CBO was mentioned. According to CBO, the Democratic bill covers 12 times as many people and saves 36 billion dollars more than the Republican plan. That's what CBO says. So, you know, I think the process itself uh, has been, uh, has actually been uh, transparent and open and deliberative um, and um, and these bills have been out there a long time and these topics have been out there a long time we've been talking about health care since Teddy Roosevelt ran for president on the bull moose party ticket and a lot of the ideas that are incorporated in these bills are not necessarily new ideas they're ideas that have been talked about over and over and over again and every time we get close to health care reform uh, the special interests weigh in, the insurance companies weigh in, and then the American people lose. I like, you know, everybody can say all they want that we, we all want to make sure that everybody gets insured. Uh, there are 40, 45 million Americans with no insurance in the richest, most powerful country in the world. That's a national scandal. We should be ashamed of that. Um, my problem with the Republican bill is that you don't insure nearly as many people as we do in the Democratic bill. Every one of you and every one of us up here has access to good health insurance, every one of us. But not everybody in this country does, and not everybody can afford it. And the whole point of this is to expand access to those who do not have insurance, uh, and to expand coverage, and to, as Mr. Rangel said, put a greater emphasis on prevent preventative care, because if you really want to control health care costs, you try to keep people well, and to find a way to control costs. And I think that that's what this Democratic proposal does. Um, I want to commend the Republicans for coming up with a Republican alternative that clearly is a difference in philosophies between the two parties, and we're seeing it, it, how it manifests itself. Well, the gentleman yield us briefly on that, just very I'm briefly. Happy to yield. I thank my friend for yielding. Let me just say that the challenges that the distinguished chairwoman posed to the panel on the Republican alternative, in fact, were addressed 
pre-existing conditions, these issues. And so I believe that this alternative is not quite as different, other than the fact that it does diminish this dramatic government takeover. Well, I, I, I thank my friend I, I, for well, yielding. I, think the I don't think you do address pre-existing conditions. And again, as CBO says, you leave many millions more without health insurance. And I don't think that that's right in the United States of America. Nobody's talking about a government takeover of health insurance. I'm happy yield to yield to the general lady from North Carolina. Well, the uh, commitment that you all have made is to cover 100% of Americans, but you're not. So explain to me why you're leaving out uh, 12 million. Well, well I, I would so claim my time. I just say we do a hell of a lot better than you do. Um, I'm happy to yield to the gentleman. Yeah. Yeah. 96 percent. 83 percent under the Republican plan. He starts out at 83 percent, and after 10 years, he stays at 83 percent. And Madam Chair, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to insert in the record the New York Times editorial, which uh, 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 criticizes the Republican health care plan. Um, the, other, the other thing I would say, Madam Chair, is that um, I think that this is a, a historic moment. I mean, to me, this is one of these FDR, Social Security, LBJ, Medicare moments. Um, this is an opportunity for us to get it right, to do something right. And I appreciate uh, all the commentary uh, by Mr. Camp and Mr. Dreyer about what the Republicans try to do. Quite frankly, I was here for most of that time. And your prescription for health care was take two tax breaks and call me in the morning. Um, that didn't do it. More and more people fell into the ranks of the uninsured, which I think is unacceptable. Um, and if we're going to, and people need to understand that the reason why we care about access, uh, getting more people access to insurance and covering those who are uninsured is not just a moral obligation, which I think we have, but every one of us pays more in taxes to pay for the cost of those people who show up in emergency rooms. So that's what this debate is about. Now, we have differences. I mean, there's, there, there are different philosophies uh, in, the two, in, the, in the parties, and that's, that's the way it is. That's, that's fine. And uh, as the chair uh, a woman uh, indicated, that the Republican substitute, she said, will be made in order uh, for debate tomorrow. And that's good. The, uh, the, there'll be two different, at least two different proposals, and you'll get a motion to recommit, I'm sure, uh, which you're guaranteed of having. So you'll have two bites of the apple, uh, uh, not just one. But you know, I have to say that um, we can't let this opportunity pass. Uh, we've come so close so many times before, and we need to get this right. It's the right thing to do for the American people. We need to control health care costs. Small businesses are telling me uh, that their uh, premiums have gone up 129 percent in 10 years. And they're telling me, unless you find a way to control these health care costs, we're going to either go out of business or we're going to have to lay people off. You know, this, if you want to talk about creating jobs and, and creating more economic, uh, economic opportunity, let's help take this health care burden off the backs of small businesses. I mean, I'd like to think we could agree on that. I think we have a better way to do it than you. We will have this debate out. Again, I appreciate everybody's uh, input and all the work of, of, uh, of your committees. Uh, but uh, I think this is a, an historic moment. My Republican friends will say that the Democratic bill is terrible. I'm sure that... My, you know, as you have heard me say, I don't think your bill is very good, but we'll fight it out. Um, Not very good is better than. Terrible. Well, I'm, I'm trying to be. I'm, I'm trying to be polite, and bipartisan. Um, but uh, keep trying. Yeah, <laughs> that's about as good as I can get. Um, but I, but I just, you know, let's not turn this into a, a, a you know, an, another battle in which kind of petty politics and mischaracterizations of bills. I mean, I've heard, you know, the, the Democratic plan described as socialist, as somehow, you know, uh, comparing it to, a, to terrorism. I mean, that's nuts. That's not, we can, do, we, we can debate the provisions that you have and the provisions that we have without using that kind of rhetoric and mischaracterizing what's, at, what's in each other's bills. And again, I just want to end by, again, thanking all of you uh, for all of your hard work, because I know you've all spent a lot of time, not just this year, but over the years. Uh, dealing with this issue. I yield back to you. Thank you, Mr. McGovern. Let me inform the members. The gentleman from Massachusetts yield Sir. for questions. I yield. Uh, my material, I want to ask you if you know that Medicaid patients visit the emergency room at twice the rate of uninsured uh, patients in this country. And that's coming from the National Center for Health Statistics. So you're indicating that having more government-paid insurance 
is going to bring down the number of people that go to the emergency room. More government paid insurance is going to increase the number of people going to emergency rooms if this statistic is accurate because twice as many people on Medicaid use emergency rooms as people without insurance. I, 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 thank, I, thank the general, I thank the general lady for making the case for keeping more people in this country uninsured. And I guess that's, if that's the Republican position, then fine. I disagree. And I would say that what we're trying to do is, is, is not only extend insurance to those who don't have it. Because if you don't have insurance, you have no choice but to go to the emergency room. But what we're also trying to do is put in place kind of a, a, a system, as Mr. Rangel said, which encourages prevention and preventative care so that people actually can not get sick and not end up in emergency room. So if you want to make the case that more and more people in this country should be uninsured, fine. I just disagree no, with I'm you. I'm not making the yes, case that more people. I'm making the case that government insurance is not the answer to the problem. Well, and I, I'm, making the case, I'm making the case that your bill doesn't insure anywhere near what our bill does, and I think that that is unacceptable and is wrong in this country. Let's hear from Mr. Pallone. Well, I just wanted to say to, to Congressman Fox that the reason for that is, is being corrected in this bill. In other words, for example, in my state, Medicaid only pays about 37 percent of actual costs. So what we're seeing around the country, in many parts of the country, is that because of the low reimbursement rate, uh, a person can, who has Medicaid cannot see a doctor. And so we're forced to the emergency room. But one of the things that this bill does is make a major uh, increase in the reimbursement rate so that it gets up to the Medicare level and even beyond. And that means that doctors will now take these Medicaid patients, they'll get primary care, they'll get to see a doctor on a regular basis, and they won't go to the emergency room. So there's a major change in this bill in terms of improving the Medicaid program. And it's all, it's at federal expense. It's not to pass on. Gentlemen, yield. Oh, I'm, I have the time. I'm what? sorry, would the gentleman yield? Yes. Yes. I heard the gentleman say that people will, ne that hospitals and patients who are in Medicaid, that all providers will be reimbursed now at Medicare rates? Primary care. In other words, if you are, want to see a primary care physician, those are the ones now that many Medicaid patients in many parts of the country, including my own state, you will not find a doctor who will take Medicaid. How about a hospital? A hospital, they go to the emergency room because they can't get regular care through a doctor. And the reimbursement rate? The reimbursement rate has changed, but it's primarily for the primary care. In other okay, words, so in other words... The primary care rate up to Medicare. Okay, so to go see a doctor, but not a hospital. But they don't need to. The yeah. problem that Ms. Fox is suggesting right. is that people go to the emergency room because they can't see a doctor. Well, I, I wasn't trying to make her point. I'm trying to find out. But the hospitals, if you're on Medicaid, the hospitals will still be reimbursed at Medicaid rates. Any provider who is uh, providing primary care gets the higher rate. Uh, How about emergency care? Including the hospital. But what I'm pointing out is people go to the emergency room is they can't see a doctor on a regular basis. You improve the Medicare reimbursement rates as we do. Those people who find a doctor, they won't need to go to the emergency room. Well, you may want take out some percentage. That's not the question I was asking. Well, and you've answered it, I believe. I think I heard what you said, and that is that a person who is on Medicaid, if they go to a primary care physician, will be reimbursed at a high level that will be Medicare rates. And if I can reclaim my time. Well, I didn't finish with the statement, okay. but go ahead. I, will. No, I, I, I just to emphasize the point that I think Mr. Rangel and Mr. Miller has, and, and Mr. Plone have made over and over again. I mean, we are trying to encourage people to go to primary care physicians to get checkups to get the kind of preventative care they need so they don't end up in emergency rooms. And we're trying to make sure that the 45 million Americans that somehow uh, Dr. Fox thinks, you know, we, we don't have to worry about, I don't get think she said that. That's not a good thing. Your own president said it's only 30 million. Just, so I, I think you have to. Let me just say this. Madam Chair. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Listen, I've, I've got to say this. Votes are on, okay? 
Now, we're going to wait until we get down to a workable number of votes because we have very short space to get to the floor. However, you gentlemen are going to have to come back after nine votes because we're not through. And in uh, response to what Mr. McGovern was saying, hospitals do really well here because they will no longer have the gigantic number of uncompensated patients because they will be insured. You can't do that. <laughs> well, if you do that, all my people here want to go with you. So uh, let's let's break for the votes and. Uh, no, go ahead. Oh, now, uh, Mr. Sessions, you're not. Let, no, wait till Mr. Sessions is finished. No, Mr. Mr. Gaspard. We haven't gotten to him yet. Mr. Sessions is. Oh, you haven't gotten to him. No, 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 still on McGovern and. Yeah, are you back my time? Are you back my time? Who have you yielded to? You, you, you are yielding you back, back your you. time. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, we'll just go downstairs. I think we should go down and, and come back at the very beginning of the last vote. What were you saying? Yeah, I'm going to go back to Alrighty, we're looking at a meeting of the House Rules Committee to determine which amendments will be allowed to the House health care bill and the parameters of debate. As you see, uh, the meeting taking a break so House members could uh, go to the floor and cast, uh, participate in a series of votes in the House. Uh, they are presently voting on a bill that authorizes Homeland Security Department to assess high-risk chemical plants. Uh, live house coverage, of course, on C-SPAN, where you can see the House health care bill debate scheduled to start tomorrow. And uh, we will have live coverage, a rare Saturday session of the House on C-SPAN. From the Associated Press, House Democrats say they don't yet have the votes to pass an overhaul of the nation's health care system and may push back the vote until Sunday or early next week. Majority Leader Steny Hoyer told reporters in a conference call that the make-or-break vote to, to make health care coverage part of the social safety net could face delay. Democrats originally hoping to pass the bill on Saturday, and uh, uh, officially that's still the plan, and that according to the Associated Press. Uh, we will continue live coverage of the House Rules Committee meeting uh, after members return from casting the series of votes now underway on the floor of the House. Topics at today's White House briefing include the deadly shootings at Fort Hood, the October unemployment